so the three topics that we're going to discuss today are uh, start with a continuation on collection. And I want then to have a few things to discuss about how to maintain a top line on a horse that stands most of the day. Uh, in the wintertime, in some of these urban barns and suburban barns and big pastures with sheds in them and wherever they are, a lot of times there's not a huge reason to run around in the winter, so they do more standing than we might want them to. And that does create changes in posture and, and uh, limits to some degree their their uh, capacity for a balanced and uh, fluid gait. And, and also they get stiff, they get cold, the willingness to move kind of tapers off sometimes. So I was uh, caused and reminded uh, not that long ago to um, that I should have mentioned when we last spoke about collection that there are some things that happen uh, just in the course of owning a horse and being around them that make it hard to keep everything in mind. From the horse's point of view, uh, to be asked or told that the time to collect is now, it can be a difficult thing if he's landing toe first. It can be a difficult thing if his way of going um, is to some degree influenced by the type of handling that he has in his schooling or non-handling, just the default of standing around heavy on the front, looking at a stall, waiting for people to come by and say hello. Quite a bit of boredom can set in. So when they get heavy in front like that or when they're schooled in such a way that causes them to kind of paddle a little bit and uh, right a straight across a line of travel to bring their feet in this way, I'm not talking about feet that turn in now. I'm just talking about a way of going that has behind it um, an amount of, of work in hand that would cause the horse to think that as a default he should be prepared to um, attempt a gymnastic exercise when he's not asked for it. In other words, just the same that if you overdo the uh, disengaging of the hindquarters, a lot of horses will end up with their right hip offset. They'll end up with a kind of a an out of balance sacrum. The the pelvis will be tipped. The uh, they'll have one hip that's higher than the other. They'll have one hock that is dropped back. And they'll just learn kind of to stand off and on a triangle more or less with the right diagonal doing most of the work. Kind of an over commitment to the left shoulder and then you got that right hip kicked out of gear. That's very common. But that has to do with just kind of stopping the exercise too soon. If you if you, if you want to continue to have a stepping over behind, a disengaging of the hindquarters, and I've shared with you my thoughts about that on a number of in a number of ways and on a number of occasions. It's it's often overdone and stopped too soon so that after that exercise I'd say the majority of people don't remember to ask the horse to step up and square up and get rebalanced on, on the right hip, bringing it up in line with the other. Um, I've seen some people think about that and they end up backing the horse his other three feet to get in line with the hip that's stuck back there, but I, I would tend to not do that. But in any case, the the horse that's balanced and safest to ride is going to be one that can... Um, put any hoof wherever it needs to be. So uh, when a default, and what I mean by default is when, when the muscle memory is replaces a natural way of going. In other words, when a horse has had a certain amount of training or a certain amount of conditioning to do the same thing over and over and over again, um, it's, it's, it's comes in there in the body as, as though it were just asked often. Um, and it's the same with people who stand on one hip. If you've had three children on one side because you're left-handed or the other side because you're right-handed, your body doesn't disapprove when you stand as though you're still holding your child. It's uh, on a hip. It's, it's just a natural way that you begin. You adopt a sort of 
ease with the posture that is done most often a horse will also experience that and display that so very often horses will stand in the pasture as though they've just been asked to disengage the hindquarters and been left at that and when that happens often the horse is left with his left hip right up underneath him right on the center line underneath his belly button and the right hip kind of cocked back and overloading in the front that happens quite often and I'm, I'm mentioning it because leads to lots of things that later are very difficult to address under saddle it's it, it leads to a certain kind of a propensity for lopsidedness a propensity for uh, resistance in in travel to the right and We'd like to try to set these horses up to be as capable physically as they are mentally. They want to follow your feel and they want to do what you ask and they love seeing you when you come or don't, but let's hope they do. And um, usually it works out so they get along with whoever owns them. They try to, most of them will try to find a way to have that happen. And now, uh, but by the time you're actually asking a horse to collect and not aware that his hip is offset or not aware that he lands toe first or not aware of how detrimental it is to the whole setup to have his mouth tied shut or to have him landing toe first on a pair of shoes that hasn't been a set of shoes that hasn't been changed in eight or ten weeks these are things that 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 it would be helpful it, it, to the horse if we began to think about that um, it ties into many, many things that people think about but don't have a lot of knowledge of. And it, it, it ties into things that people don't want to talk about. Ties into things that people have had uh, sometimes uncomfortable or unpleasant experiences questioning a trainer about or other colleagues or friends that they ride with. Um, this gets back to one of the things I was talking about last month, which was not to worry about too much about what people think or say or just keep on your track with your horse. You know, the horse is the one to please. So we want to be sure that we, that horse is absolutely the one to please because by the time you're up there and the bottom half of yourself is on the top half of him, many things can happen that we're not expecting and it's really great, much better odds if it's fine with him that you're up there and that you're reaching for each other in 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 feeling and in thought and in a shared job and that when the miscommunication is at the front of your mind both of you that instead of getting frustrated or fearing some sort of rebuke or punishment that there's a thoughtfulness that can start to bloom really bloom between you and then he says, hey, this is, <laughs> hey, you're doing it wrong. And you say, no, -uh, you're doing it wrong. And then if you can smile and say, wow, we're both really not on the job here. This is a mess. You're stumbling and I almost fell off and oh, I'm squeezing as hard as I can. I don't want to be kicking and hitting you. But uh, and he's thinking, yeah, you're squeezing so hard and uh, bits so high and it's resting on my molars and you're somebody else cinched me up and I haven't been able to breathe in 25 minutes. And um yeah, and that shampoo that you're wearing. I mean, you we have no idea how complex it is in there. And all of a sudden, the trainer says, let's, you know, let's get going here. Let's, let's do an upward transition. And, uh, you know, let's feel our way down those reins and try to pick up a soft feel and get, you know, some collection in there. Let's get some refinement in our forward gait. All of that's great. But what if he's landing toe first? If he's landing toe first, it'll feel just about to him like it will to you. If you take 20, to really get the full effect, walk 20 steps, lifting your feet up, not shuffling or bearing down on your toes, but really lifting your leg up, reaching forward and stepping down with the toe, following with a heel and doing that step after step after step. So if you do that, you're going to find out what he feels like when you're riding him in a condition that has created toe first travel. Those horses are likely to trip, just flat out fall on their noses, fall over sideways on you. If the 
turf is slippery or the terrain is uneven. A toe first landing is avoidable, so you want to have some knowledge of hooves, how they're constructed. It's a live, most important thing you can really understand before you get on um, and try to direct the feet is what is it really that you're directing? I swear there are brains in those feet. There's certainly the, I've read, I don't know this is to be true, but I've read that in the um, some of the older oriental literature that it was considered a horse had five hearts because of course the blood is recycled all the way down in those feet and pumped back up toward his heart. I guess maybe it would follow that they would be pumped up because there's no muscle below the knee, there's no muscle below the hock, so it isn't muscles that take the blood back toward the heart. It's a little um, kind of a, a a buildup of blood in the bottom and a shunt system um, where it's just it's just like I guess you would squeeze the to toothpaste out of the tube sort of I don't know I haven't really examined the actual mechanism um, but we do know that the, uh, the toxins pool in the feet sometimes and the blood is um, pumped all the way into and out of the hoof uh, on every heartbeat and uh, down and return and down and return and it's a really critical to have this uh, hoof as healthy as possible, um, as broad as possible for a big horse. You'd have a nice broad foot where the hoof actually, the, the hoof print is um, wider than the hairline. You don't want to have a, a tube for a foot, you know, just a, a, a pastern that gets in there to the coronet band and then is just like a, a pillar, just like a, a Roman candle, Christmas candle. Those are tough feet for a horse to live on. So it doesn't mean it's the end of the world. Many of them live on feet like that and, and that's it. But if you want to really have the best possible experience, we have to have the best possible foundation. And I think that more and more people, fortunately, are starting to realize that the the hoof is a really important mechanism, a really important feature of the horse's anatomy. Perhaps if you were to ask him, it might be one of the most important because that's what he's standing on and that's what he's running and stopping and breaking and turning and all of his functions, resting, defending himself, playing, play fighting, all of it. So we want to make sure that before we start to ask him in a formal way, to change his posture and change what he's going to do in a day and do it for us because we ask that he's actually physically capable of doing it without hurting himself and without becoming stressed over the thought of having to speed up in a in, in a in a in a frame in a in a um, an elevated forehand and a in a lowered hip um, and a in a sort of it's not really crouching, but it's it's a compression. It's a self-compression. It's a it's a self carriage, a, a way of going that actually, when it's done naturally, and when he does it because he wants to, not because he's asked, it is actually a state of readiness that is very very evident. That state of readiness can be seen when. Um, horses that are at pasture uh, run up alongside the fence to see who's going to come out of the trailer that just came in the, in the yard or somebody leads a new horse in down a, down a, an aisle with heads poking out and those horses will often gather themselves right up and have a very beautiful arched um, as sort of an, an arched uh, adjusted physique for the moment of introduction and for Sometimes a challenge, sometimes a submissive thing, sometimes a playful thing, but but in the in the um, getting acquainted posture, that physique is beautiful. And of course, I think that's why we aspire to ride a horse that's looking like that rather than some exhausted donkey. Plenty of those out there. But there are also many horses that would do it for us if they could. And one of the things that they would do for us if they could is never look like an exhausted donkey if they felt good about how they're moving, if they had enough room and space when they were sleeping and when they were socializing or hanging out. The stall life uh, is not a great foundation for collection. 
Um, shoes that are changed infrequently are not a great setup for collection. Horses that land toe first are very challenged when they're asked to collect. Horses that are being ridden in saddles that don't fit or that are shimmed very uh, excessively. One thing to remember about shimming a saddle, and I'm going to say this in at my peril, I guess, um, and there are a lot of good saddle fitters out there, and there are a lot of very respectable saddle makers. Um, in the endurance world, in the jumping world, the dressage world, I don't know enough about the saddle makers that serve the gated world, but I'm sure that they do a good job too, you know, when they have enough information about the horse uh, that that saddle is destined to accommodate. But, um, and the Western saddles as well, those, because there's, uh, those are, seem to be quite expensive when they're custom made, and um, I've had a number of them built for me, and I've been very happy with a few of them and very unhappy with a few others, but that's sort of the learning curve, and you have to really experiment and learn the language that is involved with having these things made properly. Um, I know some very good saddle makers, and I've been very pleased with a number of them. Being pleased with a saddle maker doesn't mean that saddle will fit more than one horse if I didn't want it to. And that's the thing that you find out going into this is that what the saddle that you get for a two or a four year old is not necessarily going to be the saddle that fits him when he's 10 unless you maintain him. And that's a thing that's usually overlooked. Um, one, of the, one of the things before we get a horse that's important to, before my students get horses and my friends and people who come and talk to me about the idea of getting a horse or they want me to do a, a pre-purchase, a pre-vet purchase exam, take me there before they get the vet. That happens quite often and when you're not really right down to put your money on the line, that's a good time to have some friend or a trainer or somebody who's a little more knowledgeable come in and help you see whether the horse is even suitable on a bigger, bigger, broader stroke way of looking at it. Um, but the backs that are the backs that are struggling are not going to be backs that you're going to want to sit on and try to start schooling. And uh, you know, a back will pull away from pressure. A back will pull away from a rider. So you want to think about what I can do. Uh, one belly lift before you ride isn't it. Uh, that's it's it's a good start, but it's not going to fix a back, and it's not going to do anything except make you feel good about having done it that time. Um, there's much more that goes into um, a belly lift that's effective and also the duration and the way it's done. There are many, many ways to lift a belly and there are many ways to do it. The way I like to do it is the way that teaches the horse how to do it. Um, you can make a dog sit and stay uh, and you can teach him in a way that will always make you do the work to make him sit and stay. Or you can have a dog just learn how to sit and stay off a wink or a nod, or an exhale, or just the slightest gesture of your hand or your foot or your elbow. I mean, there are many, many, many ways to be subtle. And when I'm working on a horse's anatomy and working on addressing some discomfort and some long-term hard-fought changes in the body that have got them kind of distorted and maybe not in the best mood to serve the needs and agenda of somebody who wants to walk, trot, lope, change directions, go to a show, collect for the fun of it, collect for a reason, another reason. Um, the horses that are struggling with the bodies that have been shaped by quick rides, you've heard the expression probably, ridden hard, put up wet. Even if you're not ridden hard and put up wet, if you're ridden at all and stuck back in a stall, uh, there you stand. So many of these things can be um, thought about in, in, a, in a broader way, just allowing the horse to eat and drink off the ground is going to go a long way toward helping him recover from having um, been taken out of a stall, um, tacked up, ridden, and put back. Um, just the stretch from his head reaching the ground. When you're feeding a horse on a four-foot uh, box or, or pan, or in, and he's drinking higher than his chest, all of these are small but contributing things that um, 
adjust. He has to adjust to the way his feet, teeth are going to be, the way his jaw is going to be hanging off his skull. The head is one of the most, the head and the face is one of the most sacred parts of any of any living thing. And so um, it's very important if you are really a student of the classics, you're going to you're going to not do anything to restrict the movement of the jaw. The idea that you're going to tie a mouth shut or buy a bridle that is already impossible not to tie the mouth shut, um, it, it, it's just, uh, it's, it's a shame, is what it is. It's a shame. And I'm not, you know, condemning anyone for doing it because nowadays you can hardly buy a bridle without it. To understand how the use of the flash nose band or the, you know, when we talk about a flash nose band or a figure eight nose band or a drop nose band or a Micklem bridle or any of these other adjustments that are made. It could be something that people do off their hackamores or they do it off their mechanical hackamores. I've seen an amazing configurations that are put together to keep that mouth tied shut around that bit. Now, the thing to remember, once you start to interfere with the motion of that jaw and the, uh, the way that the, that the, the, the whole setup in the head right at the right underneath, right at the back of the jaw, right in the center of the whole works. That is so directly affects what he can do with his pelvis, what he can do. You, it's, it's important to remember that the whole setup is really stabilized at the hip. And when you want him to carry more weight back there and squ essentially squat, you know, some horses, if you notice horses that are really good at getting out of trailers backwards, they'll just drop, they'll get up on their tiptoes and they'll just squat back down until they are right at the edge and then they know kind of what to expect and they back out of there. But it's, it, they almost do sort of like a backward levade, uh, some of these horses that back out. Um, but if you were going to employ that posture for forward motion and instead of being on the tiptoes, you were actually on a flat hoof, um, it would be infinitely more difficult for a horse to do that without access to his diaphragm. His diaphragm is intimately and intrinsically set up to influence the way that he can use his hips and his, and his pole is set up and his jaw, his breathing apparatus is tied uh, very um, directly to the flexibility, lateral and longitudinal flexibility of the pole. So the most important thing for us to try to understand before we're struggling and frustrated with the fact that we're not meeting our own goals to get the horse collected is to see what other small things, but very big for him or her, uh, what, what, what contributing uh, pieces of the puzzle for the horse are we aware of or not aware of or aware of and not addressing because it seems too small. Um, I would just say reach deep and cast the net wide for um, solutions to why uh, the horse can't collect when he's asking the way that you like. And uh, maintenance of the top line, the way the equipment fits. I started to talk about shimming a saddle so it fits. Um, sorry, I'm jumping all over the place. It's been a, kind of a long, cold day. and I just kind of barely got back here in time for this but I'm glad to be sharing these things with you and I want to remind you what it's like when you go to the shoe store and it could be a real fancy one or it could be footwear or Walmart's back wall but if the shoe that you like is in a size that's too small and you just can kind of barely do it and you're hoping it's going to stretch and so you ram your foot in there would it really occur to you to add a thick sock because it was a bit too small? Too narrow, so add a sock. Got to watch that shimming those saddles that don't fit, okay? Anyway, that's the point on that. I do not want to drag this out longer than necessary. I went on too long last time. It was three hours. Sitting up there on YouTube now, three hours. I'm embarrassed. That's too long to be talking, although it was over two days and it was five segments. But for some reason, it seemed like I had a lot to say, maybe just too much. That's too much. So I'm going to keep it short tonight. 
Um, I, I didn't get back here in time to make a proper diagram for you, but I am going to try to, I'm going to try it this way. I'm really not so good on these yet, so I'm going to try it like this. Uh, it was so bad before that the camera just shut off and the phone quit the deal and just deleted the, the, everything we did a few minutes ago. So it must have been pretty bad. Here is a line of travel. This is my idea. I, I, don't, I have a little bit of writing on here. We'll just ignore it. Here is a front foot tracking down that line on either side of that line. This is a narrow-shouldered horse, one could think. Now, here are some horses I recently saw with the hips on the line of travel, just barely. But this front foot came right over in front of the back foot, and this front foot came over in front of that front foot, and on certain types of ground, came all the way across. So literally, the horse was crossing over, and many of them were. Now, over here, if you were just going to look at the front feet on the ground. The back feet were also doing it a little bit on a couple of horses, but the front feet go like this. And you can see that there's a problem there because if you're going to speed that way of going up to a lope, you better be on a tabletop. You better not be planning on running around roots and rocks or moguls or weeds and sticks and stuff around there because this and this could be the difference between surviving the ride and not if you get outside a riding ring. This right here, to me, when I see this, it uh, shows evidence of a lot of um, in-hand work that has been left without straightening the horse up afterwards. So it, it becomes a default. When I see, uh, when I see this, it, it, it's nothing wrong with a horse. It's not conformational, and it's not genetics. It's not bad breeding. It's use. And that's, I'm going to say, I'm, I don't think I'm wrong about it. I might not be right, but I don't think I'm wrong. When you see a group of horses that are traveling like this, you see a group of horses that are traveling like this, and you see uh, that the front of the feet are shiny, and the horses are landing toe first. Um, it's time to start to think about what we can do to tip it around. We want the horses to straighten out their footfall, widen their shoulders. The wider the wider the shoulder blades, the more room there is for the wither to um, come through for you. The wither is going to be your link between your thoughts and his ability to deliver. If you can get to the hip, but you've lost the wither, you're not going to have that maneuver. You're not going to have that. You're not going to have that resilience. He's not. He's going to be struggling. He's going to be struggling to find a way to get the root of the neck and all the whole network of muscles that supports that front end. He's going to not even know where to draw from. If the way that he's handled and the way the groundwork and in-hand work and socialization and the housekeeping, meaning the animal husbandry, the choice of how to keep him, if he's sedentary, looking out a stall or leaning on a gate or a fence, that front end heaviness. So as you pick up the feet and you feel resistance, you get tempted to push your shoulder into that leg or into that knee. What I want you to do is catch yourself. By the time you're leaning into a leg and he's saying, oh, no, 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 um, already he's telling you that you having control of his feet is not, not maybe what he needs to be doing. So for him to offer you the front end, offer you those hips, offer you the adductors, the abs, the neck, the, the shoulders, the mind behind it all, every bit of his skeleton, every bit of his willingness to go forward and go forward in a way that you feel will be graceful and beautiful. I wouldn't want to start a relationship 
meaning a ride, where you're asking for those things. I wouldn't want someone to ask me to dance that way and start by pulling my leg out from under me. Ask for that hoof. Teach yourself if you don't know how to pick up a foot or receive a foot by asking, set a horse up to offer you a hoof instead of reluctantly submit to letting you drag it up there and then have to struggle with you for two or three seconds or five minutes while you try to clean it. The difficulty you have with those feet is going to be the difficulty he has understanding your same hands on those reins to his mouth, into his mind, all the way down to his body, to his feet. His feet are not going to be able to close that gap of understanding if you're picking his feet and handling his hooves that way. That's why I say it because I've seen it's the same. The way people handle the feet with a hoof pick is the way they handle the mouth to get to the feet in most cases. Certainly not all. That wouldn't be fair to say. I don't know all. I just know that I've seen it an awful lot. So start to have your awareness come right into your hands when you're asking for feet. On that top line maintenance, let's make sure that you haven't got a left stifle that's a problem from too much stuffing over behind or a right hip that has got a, an inflamed piriformis muscle and weak glutes on the upper part of the croup all the way down that panel from the top of his butt all the way down toward the point of his hip. You want to make sure that you film. Um, anyway, I'm going to continue. So you want to, you want to think about how uh, when you have, uh, when I'm on a horse and I'm thinking about four feet underneath me, I'm thinking about the uh, shoulders and I'm thinking about the fact that I'm, I'm actually hanging off that hip. If the shoulders and the neck are not available and the feet are not landing heel first, I'm actually on a downhill ride toward the ground from his hip. And if the sacrum, even make it worse, is offset, that means I actually, I might even, it's just like being on a bike with two flat tires or on a car with three. It's just not the best seat in the house. So you can do an awful lot to improve that. Um, one of the things that can be helped, as I said, is by changing some of his um, your, your barn and your barn and stable uh, practices, so that he can eat with a lower head right off the ground. Hay and grain. Yes, it's more trouble. Yes, it's harder. You got to go in there and pick, take the bucket up so he doesn't poop in it. And you got to make sure that you've got his hay in a place that it's not going to get all messed up with where he goes to the bathroom. And those are those are maintenance details that um, when those considerations move to the top of the list, it's just a little detail. It's like not letting your kid go out the house with a runny nose, you know. There are, it just, it's an extra little detail. You either keep him in till he gets better or give him something to clean his nose with. But to just go on as though it doesn't matter the condition that the horse is actually in, and a lot of this is about getting your eye developed so that you can actually see the condition that the horse is truly in. And this is going to be apart from how much supplements you purchase and how much you care. It's going to be apart from how your heart is feeling. It's going to be apart from your checkbook. It's going to be apart from how much you love going to the barn. It's all different from that. Your horse can love all those things, his supplements, his food, his stall. He can love seeing you. All that stuff can be just as fun for him as it is for you, and his condition can be deteriorating with every ride. And if you don't know it and can't see it, you're going to have a comeuppance that's going to be a heartbreaker or an accident that's going to be a life stopper. Usually it doesn't get that bad. But if you're going to take a horse that's technically unsound, and you'd be surprised how many I won't get on. People look at me sometimes as though I've lost my mind. Why won't you ride my horse? A lot of horses really are not fit to ride. They really aren't. And if you're going to be on one, that means you've got to be ready to gallop. It means you've got to be ready to do whatever he offers you. And if he's not fit enough to manage your combined weight on the terrain you're on or in the circumstances you're in, 
just because he's either out of shape or undeveloped or he's got a compromise, his teeth aren't right, diaphragm's too tight, top line's too compromised, feet are landing toe first, heels are contracted, got an abscess brewing that you're not aware of, been packing a bad stifle, a, a painful stifle and ridden anyway, which most are. Healing a stifle up is a big job. I've done it a couple of times. It's a labor of love. It can be nothing more can be said about it. To actually come through a damaged stifle and get that stifle repaired, um, it's just easier not to have it happen. But sometimes they skid, they slide, they fall, or they do the splits in the mud or on the ice. Um, sometimes it's not avoidable. But most of the stifle problems that I see are um, the result of the way they're used, the way that the use that they get, the routines that they're in has weakened, weakened the left hind in one way and weakened the right hind in another way. And that a lot of that can be addressed if you just get to a point where you can pay, where you can be mindful of having a horse that's squared up underneath you. It doesn't matter if you lean over and look down. It's okay. You can see where the feet are. You want the horse to leave with a hind foot first if you can. You'd like him to be able to step up into a stride. If he doesn't, it's also okay. But the horses that are kind of pulled into a stride by a rein instead of ridden forward off the hip and then directed with the rein, but when they're pulled into the front, pulled on, onto the forehand with a rein that's used like an ignition key, it's going to be hard for those horses to stay sound over time. So the adjustments you're going to make to the top line have more to do with how you're going to keep your horse rather than what you're actually going to hire somebody to do or do with your own hands when, when, it, when it's next to a lost cause. Um, there, you can put some traction on the tail. Some horses will get very, very used to that and really look forward to it. You can put traction on the tail left and right. Make sure you don't just walk up behind a horse, stand there and start tugging on his tail, please, and then make me a bad phone call. Um, you have to ask. You, you, you want to be, have permission for these things. Uh, the tail could be helped by being scratched with your fingernails with permission. The, the tail is a the tail is one of the least understood and least used um, direct avenues to his heart and his mind. Something that has never been scratched, never been massaged, never been brushed or handled. Um, it could either feel very good or very scary. Some of the, some of them will be uh, quite protective and want to clamp their tail in or swish it to get rid of you and maybe move off or lift up a hip and want to kick you or something, just warn you to stop doing it, then then do less or come back tomorrow and give it another try. Um, any of the things that we are trying to do to help the horse, if we can see that the process of presenting that uh, agenda or need, our need to help, because we know that it will be better in the end for him if we can, make sure that the request is made uh, in such a way that doesn't require him to submit in order to receive your help because it kind of uh, runs across purposes to the whole point of trying to help if he's got to submit to something that feels either foreign or upsetting or too sudden or too much too soon. Work him into it. Get his permission for the small things along the way I would. Um, the horses that are used for driving that have had a crupper or packing, those horses don't seem to have as much difficulty having their tail handled. They get quite used to it. Um, I always like to put a, a crupper on a horse or put a rope under the tail before I pony them or before I use them, before I rope off one. I'm a, not a good roper, of course, but uh, when I was fooling around with that and when I still do fool around with it, I want to make sure that any horse you've got out there in a when you're out there with ropes and other people, you want to be sure that a horse can handle a, a tail, a rope under his tail. Um, well, you could have a different kind of ride right away. And I'll put it like that because some horses will surprise you and 
think it through enough to lift their tail up and drop that rope. Others will clamp it in there and then wonder who put what up there and then away they go. It's not the best ride to have either. The horses that are tricky to have their back feet picked up, you can ask from a hawk. Just get so that you can just touch their hawk like that. Maybe you take the hawk this way and just ask a little bit. But these battles with the feet, however they are done, whatever it's all about, whether you've got a farrier that's tough on them or they're tough on the farrier, however it is, uh, the least resistance that you can manage to bring out of your horse <clears throat> is going to make it the, the easiest environment from which to ask him to gather up for you and to um, offer you his most, a most athletic way of delivering impulsion uh, th that, that would be for your use. Um, I'm going to encourage you, any of you that are riding in circles, to ride in the biggest possible circle that you can. And I'm go you know, if, if riding in circles is, is something that's done often, I would, I would encourage you to do it on large circles most of the time, not small ones. And I would also encourage you to ride out in a straight line because so many of the times we are riding the body but not the mind. And it depends on how you divide your groundwork up. But if you make a separation in your handling between the mind and the body, these exercises are for the mind, these exercises are for the body, it's a very common thing to see people do it that way or to even not think about it at all. Just to do it because it was thought to be or told to be or learned to be the right thing to do. And it might be. But in the end, if the horse isn't with you on it and you don't realize it until you've got a leg on either side of him, then all of the preparation that went into the ride that he's not with you on needs to be looked at from there forward in another way so that you can start to offer a relationship in your groundwork that brings to your awareness not only his comprehension but his appreciation of you having asked him. Um... Some of these things I'm talking about, people have never thought of. Uh, and some of these things people have thought of, but ma might have thought so privately. I've had many people tell me when they hear me talk about these things that they didn't think it was a legitimate thing to mention to a trainer. And um, I'm not sure what to say about that, but I think it is fine to talk about anything you want that concerns the mental and physical well-being of your horse. Because to stuff that, to minimize it, to sweep it under the rug, or to say, for whatever reason you give yourself, that it's not worth bothering someone with, or it's too far off the normal things that are talked about to, 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 to mention it. It is worth it. Because at the point where you're sitting up there without an answer to what your horse is about to tell or ask you, and you don't have an answer for that animal, it means that you didn't have an answer for him on the ground either because you may not have heard him, may not have understood him, might not have learned yet to read him. Because very often, what they're questioning and resisting under saddle, they already have got a lot of experience resisting on the ground. It's just that you might not have seen it. You might not have known it at that time. Okay? So, before this blooming phone... It cuts out on me for the fourth time. This is not the phone. It's this, uh, whatever it is, it makes this thing work. I don't know why it does it. It baffles me. We're going to talk now about this. I'm going to talk about this dilemma that people come across, this very important question that they ask themselves sometimes. Some don't, and that's okay too. But 
the idea of whether you're going to leave your horse in shoes or not, you're going to purchase shoes and the maintenance that goes along with trimming a foot and exchanging a set of shoes or putting them back on, whichever is done. That choice is a choice, and going barefoot is a choice. Buying a barefoot horse that's never been shod is a choice. Buying a horse that's barefoot and that you decide to shoe at any age is a choice. Thought should be given, and I mean careful thought, to what is going to be the best, highest use of your animal for your goals and how the support around you, meaning who's available to do the shoeing or trimming if you don't know how, or who's available to teach you if you want to learn how, those are things that I would give careful thought to before you start ripping shoes off and saying, okay, now he's barefoot. Ah, didn't work. Got to put the shoes back on. Um, you can certainly tear a set of shoes off, remove them carefully, trim them up, and have a horse that's dead lame for a month. That's absolutely possible to do. It's also possible to do it another way. It's very easy to take a sound, healthy hoof and decide you're going to put shoes on, and he can be lame with his first set of shoes for the first month too. So I think in all of this, it is not a matter of do we shoe or don't we shoe, in my opinion. That's too broad and too kind of idiotic to make it so black and white like that because you can argue, and I understand the argument, and I go along with it. Sometimes I tolerate it. Sometimes I outright agree with it. It depends on the circumstance. It's not correct to say that all horses should be barefoot and all horses should be shod because I would hate to have anybody sound that. I would hate to try to have a conversation with anybody who thought that way, to be honest with you. First of all, so much of this decision has to do with more about what we don't know than what we do know. It's easiest just to go along with what's done at your barn. It's easiest to go along with what the horse had barefoot or shoes when you got them. It's easiest to listen to someone you trust and like and know whether they know anything or not. It's the trust and the like and the personality that keeps people working together. It's not always about knowledge. Some of the most knowledgeable people in the world, you can't even stand being around them. And I'm not just talking about horses either, but personality has a lot to do with how um, trainers and breeders and vets and farriers and stable owners get work and keep work. You're a nice guy or a nice woman, you're going to have friends. Your friends want to help you because you're fun to be around. They want to do what you want because or what you recommend because it feels good feels good to be liked. It feels good to be doing what other people are doing. And I'm not saying that everybody's out there doing it just for that. There are plenty of people that bolt and do their own thing their own way and still have those friends. But when you're getting started, you want to ask the questions. When you're getting started, you want to it's very normal and very uh, understandable that people want to fit in. They want to do the right thing. I don't know anybody who goes out and buys a horse and says, I'd like to make the biggest 10 mistakes I can make just to make sure I get them out of the way. That's not the way people think, usually. I think people want to not make a mistake in their training and in their care. They don't want to make a, a big mistake that's going to bring, you know, make them feel foolish or embarrassed or the subject of ridicule and uh, being ostracized in a new, fairly, it's quite common for barns to be clicky and closed and sort of you work your way in or you don't or you're the guy on the outside or you care or you don't care. All of that stuff is just about people. But nevertheless, your horse is going to be living with your decisions. So, so much of the decision about whether to shoe or not shoe is going to be how often is the foot maintained. It doesn't matter. With shoes or without shoes, they need maintenance. They need, mo they need movement. They need circulation. And probably the the thing that is more important than whether you shoe or don't shoe is, is your horse moving? 
or is he standing around 20 hours a day? The horses that are standing in shoes 20 hours a day are the horses that you want to kind of pay a little closer attention to in terms of their exercise, um, whether they get turned out with other horses or they just get turned out in a pen and then they're standing there in the up against the fence waiting to come in. Um, motion is really important. Movement is really, really important. So whether you shoe or you don't shoe, it's going to mostly be a matter of, I think, of uh, who do you get to do it? What's going to be your use? How frequently can you arrange for the maintenance? Uh, what what are going to be the signs that you learn about? What are the signs of a, of, a, of a shoe that's not working out? A nail that's too high? A heel that's too close? Do you know when your farrier is working on your horse whether he's fitting the hoof to the shoe or the shoe to the hoof? These are things to learn about. So I would say that it's really important to be respectful of what other people do with their horses unless you really know that it's some kind of intentional abject disregard then it, people have to people have to find out their own way people have to find out how to how to do it uh, lack of sureness is a big problem in the horse industry lack of sureness is usually right next to a certain kind of in, in some people, it, it, it goes right along with a certain type of bravado or a certain type of excessive displays of I don't know what. I said I was going to keep it short. I have a lot of counting to do. I'm going to make... Where's that hat now? Here it is. Look at this. Look at this thing. Here's our, here's our hat for our drawings. Look at this baby. It's quite the hat. Here's a horseshoe. Speaking of shoes, to shoe or not to shoe. Oops. Here's some other horseshoes it's got. There's four of them right in there. It's kind of a snappy, kind of a snappy number. So I'm going to definitely be pulling uh, one drawing out of this hat <laughs> and the other drawing out of this furry thing that showed up here the other day. Somebody gave me this for the shop. All right, so I think it's going to be time now for me to sit down. I said I would do this drawing before midnight, just so that you know. Um, I think it's not fair to have so many interruptions in a, in a, in a, I really didn't want it to go this way, but it did. Um, I said that by 8 o'clock, whoever had shared the Desmond Outfitter page, I would make a card and stick it in that hat. I already realize there are too many names for that hat. So we'll do, I'll mix it up or I'll get, I've got a feed pail over there I can use. I'll see what it's like and I'm going to give myself about an hour. And I'm going to come back on here and I'm going to pull a drawing for a copy of Bill's book. And, uh... Then another drawing for a uh, rope and halter, okay? So here's Bill's book. This is going to be the first drawing right here. And if anybody, before I get, if anybody can, you want to, if you have not um, shared that page with your friends, and I'm, I'm, I'm really hoping that you will because I want to make some other material that's coming up in the, in the winter and spring available to more people. So I'm hoping that, by asking you to share the Desmond Outfitter page, which is where I'm going to release this information, not on my personal page, um, that uh, will reach more people who might be interested in doing um, doing things that they've thought about, doing things that they've read about. Okay, here we are. Look at this bulging I'm gonna make a drawing now this will be our final nightcap 
took a while to get everybody's name on these little pieces of paper here. So I'm gonna shake it up. This is gonna be a drawing for a copy of Bill's book, True Horsemanship Through Feel. So whoever I pick will get that book. I will send it to you. We can work out the details on where to ship it to you. So I'm gonna dig in there now and get that. Come here, book. What are you doing? All right. So I'm gonna, good luck. And thank you for all of your shares and participation this evening and that rickety little strung together series of disjointed thoughts. Okay, here it is. Oh my goodness. Congratulations, Lily Wren. Look at you. You get an extra book. One for the bicycle, one for the car, one for the barn. So great. Lily, I have your address. I will send that out to you. And let me put the next batch we have the overflow into the next one. Congratulations, Lil. And the rest of them, here we go. Ready? If I had a drum roll, I would drum roll. Roll the drum. Okay. If we had one more person here, I could just hold the hat and somebody else could pick it. Well, well, this one jumped out. Who is this? Let's see. Good luck. Rope and halter. Sally Spencer. Right here, all the way to Scotland, this rope and halter has to go. Wow. Very nice. When, uh... All right. I want to thank everybody for all of your good questions and your shares and your commitment to everything. So we have a book going out to California to Lily Wren and a rope and halter going to Sal. And I just can't help myself. I'm going to have to pick two more. I'm going to have to pick two more. That's it. There's so many of you tried for this one. I'm going to so this will be for another, this will be for a book. Okay? I'm changing the rules. Oh, that's hard. I got two. What do I do now? I have to start over. Let me see. Okay, here's one. This is really fun. This is like Christmas. Rick Weinberg. <laughs> Look at that. Rick, are you there? Let's see if Rick's on there. So, Rick, you just got another book. How many times? This is actually great. You actually had the most beat up used book. All right, so Rick and Lily both get books. Sally Spencer gets a rope and a halter. I got one more rope and halter to pick. This is really fun. This is so fun. All right. Whoops, I'm almost out of a battery here, you darn phone. All right, here comes it. Ha! Huh. To Canada this goes. Chris Eves. Good for you, Chris. Thank you. All right, you guys. We'll do it again sometime. Sorry the rest of you didn't win. Sorry I don't have a million of them to give away, but that's what we'll do. i got to remember who's getting what now. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. I will talk to you all later and see you in January. So wonderful and if i can help meanwhile send me an email or a phone call and i wanted you to know that we are working on trying to get a live stream for the a team to participate in I think Sue Norman put me up to this. That's your Sue. The A-Team put me up to this. 
to get a it possible to use the telephone to film record I, I don't know it's I hope it's better than this that cuts out all the time that'll be really disappointing for people to actually pay money to watch and then I have to work it out I'll figure it out I'll let you know I'm gonna get some I'm going to have to get some kind of other help. I can't manage too much of this. I, I couldn't possibly bear it. I would be beside myself to be trying to have a course or conduct some sort of enrollment to a course, and then you have this thing cutting out all the time. I would be, I would be unfit to proceed. So we'll see. Thank you. Have a good night. It's late here, almost 12. Merry Christmas to you and to your horses. Thank you for participating. <laughs>